Welcome back to another episode of Growth Minds, guys. Today we have Dr. Deborah So on the podcast. You may have seen her interview on the Joe Rogan Experience, and I was excited to have her on. You know, she's got quite the credentials. Former, uh, or sorry, current black belt in Taekwondo, former sex academic researcher. Uh, where she specialized in gender, sex, and sexual orientation, and is now a journalist. Uh, she's the author of The End of Gender, a new book uh, called De- it's around debunking the myths about sex and identity in our society, a very controversial yet much needed topic to discuss. And you know, when I first brought her on, the first thing that she said to me was, oh, you're very brave to have me on. And I was honest with her in that, you know, I I think I was very curious about this non-binary movement that's been happening and how it's been politicized in our society. I don't really know much about it, to be honest. And And I told her that it probably was out of naivety. I don't exactly know what's going to happen from the routes of this podcast once it does come out. But this is really the purpose of a podcast like this, which is to have a free-flowing, non-biased conversation that opens up new ideas and new conversations around things that are happening in society, especially the things that I don't understand, which is a lot of things. So nevertheless, I'm excited to hear what you guys think about this conversation with Dr. Deborah So, and I hope you enjoy. Dr. Deborah So, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, excited to dig in with you. It's a big topic, a timely topic, but very big. Not something I would say I'm an expert in, which is why I was so excited to bring you on. But to give people some context, of course, I wanted to come into the interview in the perspective of, I think, how a lot of people uh probably around the world face which is there is a lot of questions that have left uh unanswered and oftentimes gloomy in terms of where people stand in these situations and i'm one of those people and and i wanted to bring you on an expert in this subject and give people you know at least questions that i would personally like to answer and yeah, I'm really excited to have you on and to have some of these questions answered. Absolutely. And I have to say you're very brave too, because anyone who has me on their show faces potential cancellation. <laughs> well, you know what? This is a timely topic and I'd have had worse, I would, I would say, you know, <laughs> in terms of these topics. So bring it on. Um, so I, I guess this brings us to the question we were talking off air about this being a really timely topic and you, you know, really digging in and focusing to finish the book uh, and get it out there. And I guess that is my question is, I, I think five and 10 years ago, the topic just would not even be something that I would have been aware of. And even to this day, when I'm asking friends of mine, what their opinions on about certain topics that, you know, around transgenderism and and gender dysphoria, uh, a lot of people just don't know enough information. So why is it that in just in the early days, quite recently, it's just been such an apparent issue that so many people are talking about versus perhaps 10 years ago, or even 20 or 30 years ago? I think it's a number of factors, one being that this particular ideology around gender, which is actually influencing scientific research that's being done, it's influencing the kinds of work that's being published, and the way we ultimately talk about these issues in our day-to-day lives, uh, these fringe ideas have been circulating within academia for a long time. But because they weren't in the mainstream, I think most people were blissfully unaware. And as they started to to come into the mainstream, 
there was still a larger consensus that this is something that is going to stay in academia. It's never going to affect those of us who are not involved in the ivory tower. So why invest effort into trying to make sense of it, trying to, I mean, people are busy, understandably. So I, I think it's just been easy for, for the average person to just ignore it. Or I, in many cases, people don't even realize that it's become a problem until it's at work. It's in their training. It's in their kids' curriculum. It's affecting families they know or their own family. And I would say probably in the last year, it's gotten especially bad. And it continues to get progressively worse. So that's one aspect of it. I think it's also because within scientific research, there has been a very long and uh, ugly history between transgender activists and sex researchers. I'm a former academic sex researcher. And because of that history and because of the animosity that some activists have for legitimate scientific experts, experts in the field don't want to say anything that's going to go against particular narratives because they know they're going to pay a heavy price for that. In some cases, they will be fired. They have their reputations ruined. Activists will go after their families. Like There's no boundaries in terms of where the animosity ends. So those things combined, uh, and I think also because people are being lied to, they're being told that the newest, the so-called newest scientific research backs up the, uh, these ideas when it doesn't. So in The End of Gender, I, I go through nine different myths and I talk about why these nine different ideas are myths, why they're not factually true. And I offer all of the scientific evidence as to why they are myths. So anyone who's interested can pick up the book. They can look into the studies themselves if they want to learn more. If they're in a situation where someone is saying something ridiculous like biological sex is a spectrum, gender is a social construct, young kids with gender dysphoria should transition, there are no differences between women who are born women and trans women, um, any, any of that stuff, that very heavily ideologically based um, bias, I suppose. <laughs> I'll just call it that. It is. It's bias. It's, it's propaganda. Yeah. They can fight it that way. Right. And just to clarify that point, because I, I think I remember you really making sure to bring up this point, because I guess at a first glance, people might be confused about the title the end of gender <laughs> and maybe we should clarify exactly what you mean by that because it could really go two ways if people don't know your stance on it right so i i chose the title the end of gender to refer to the end of our accurate understanding of gender because of science denial because of denial of biology um because of this growing um claim i would say very far left claim even I, I still consider myself to be a liberal and even progressive in some ways. I'm just not in favor of these far left ideas about gender. This claim that gender has nothing to do with biology, it's not tethered to reality, it's based solely in self-identification and we shouldn't challenge that. So these are all things I talk about in the book as to why they're unhelpful and, and factually not true. Right. And, and what are some of these wor like negative implications of not tying biology for what it is? to gender in terms of how we function as a society? Like what are some of these negative implications that could happen? So biology has been deemed hateful. It's been deemed bigoted. It by default is seen as transphobic in some circles. I disagree with that. I'm very much in favor of trans rights and I think we can advocate for respect and legal protections for the trans community and intersex people and anyone who's different or gender nonconforming, children with gender dysphoria. I think we can advocate for love and compassion. We don't have to deny what the science says. So I think the suppression of biology is coming from in many cases, people who either don't understand anything about the scientific literature, they don't understand the scientific method, um, they don't know anything about biology, so it's easy to just dismiss it, or they'll suppress it because that's the only way they can really fight it. And they see it as threatening because they don't understand it. So I, I can understand for, say, trans people who transition to the opposite sex, it's I, I do think it's insensitive to refer to, refer to a trans person by their birth sex. and by default, their birth sex is defined by biology. So I understand some of the underlying rationale for why people don't want to talk about biology in certain contexts. But at the same time, I think it hurts the trans community. And I've had many trans people reach out to me saying they, they disagree with me in that if biology didn't exist, what is the point of transition? Because for someone who's transgender, they're transitioning from one sex to another. So if biological sex didn't exist, why would they need to transition? And then 
this the idea of transitioning and, and the so-called trans umbrella has now brought into also encompass people who are non-binary. So these are people who identify as either a mix of both genders or neither. And they are now saying that they are part of the trans community. Although to me, and, and many trans people will agree, um, there's a difference there because people who transition to a binary sex, they will usually undergo at minimal a social transition. They will often undergo medical interventions like hormones and in some cases surgery. Non-binary people will often just say, uh, these are my pronouns. They'll pick a different set of pronouns and that are not he or she. They'll change their haircut and suddenly declare themselves trans. And I'm not transgender, so I don't want to speak for the community. But to me, that that seems very flippant to say that you are the yeah. same as this community who is. Um, I mean, I, I know many trans people. I interviewed Buck Angel, who is a very prominent icon in the trans community. I would say he's just an icon, period. Um, and it's it's just not I don't feel it's appropriate. Yeah. And I just want to get these terminologies factually correct and out there because I think there is a lot of confusion between what like the differences between maybe transgender, transsexual, uh, and even non-binary. Uh, can we just clarify some of these things just so that pe we can keep people on the same page there? Yeah. So transsexual is a medical term. It's It was the more commonly used term historically. It's been deemed insensitive now by some people, but other people will will still identify that way because there's an emphasis on medical transition in that definition. Mm. So someone is transitioning medically to the opposite sex. Transgender is the more recent, uh, I guess, iteration of, I don't even want to say the word transsexual, but I will in this context, um, to say that it's it, it has more of a component in identity and how you feel to, I think, distance itself from the the mandate of having undergo some, undergoing some sort of medical aspect to it. And then non, does that make sense? Yeah, right, keep going. And then non-binary is, I would say purely self-identification and feelings. It's not, there's no medical diagnosis. So gender dysphoria is a medical diagnosis, I should clarify. So that mm -hmm. is when someone feels more in alignment with their with the opposite sex than their birth sex. So there's a very large body of research documenting this as a legitimate mm. condition. Non-binary people um, do not experience gender dysphoria. Um, I mean, the, the well, some of them may, but it, the fact that there is no clear, there's no clear scientific evidence for this idea of gender not being binary, that's where I'm skeptical. I have no issue right. using the pronoun someone wants me to use being respectful in that way. And I think you can identify however you want. But my issue is when people start bending what science says to facilitate whatever it is they want to f achieve socially. Yeah, the, the non-binary one seems to be confusing for me personally. So trans is basically when you identify or you express yourself as the opposite sex that you were born into per se. So you are acknowledging that there are uh, is a male and female, whereas a non-binary person thinks there's a third or fourth or fifth gender, whatever it might be, just an anonymous gender that, uh, and they don't identify some, this, themselves either as male or female. Is that is that correct? Right. And so what we're seeing, as I was saying earlier, is that non-binary people are lumping themselves in as transgender now uh, because I think what they want is the legitimacy of th what the mm. transgender community has, has attained for itself. Um, and the other difference I would emphasize is between gender dysphoria and trans and identifying as transgender, because in many cases you'll hear people talking about transgender children. And I really don't like that. And I talk in the book about why, because gender dysphoria is an actual medical condition, whereas transgender is more of a an identity label, it's a political label in some cases, and children don't have the capacity to decide if they want to be part of a, of a political movement. But what you'll see is adults will refer to these kids as transgender kids because it adds to, I think, the legitimacy of whatever political agenda they're trying to push. Gotcha. And what percentage of the population are we talking about for people that are transgender, uh, and then also people that are non-binary. So in the American adult population, about six in 1,000 people are transgender. Uh, 
And then okay. with non-binary, 10% of millennials. That's been the latest statistic. So that's a lot. That's a lot of people. 10% of millennials mm -hmm. are non-binary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Huh. And we can talk um, about what I actually think it's about. I think it has to do with a lot of other things that may not even really have to do with gender. I don't, because some people might say they experience gender dysphoria. You also have some people who are transitioning and they will say they don't have gender dysphoria. They're transitioning just because they want to live as the opposite sex. Because in many cases, you'll have someone who's born female who says they'd rather live as a man because life is easier living as a man. So they will say, I don't an, have gender dysphoria. But a non-binary person, there's no gender dysphoria there, right? Because they're not choosing that they feel one opposite sex or the other. They're just saying there is no gender they feel. My sense is, because there actually isn't very much research, there's certainly not objective research about this movement because it's considered hateful to question it. Me, By me saying that non-binary is not a thing, that's considered hateful. So hmm. I do think for some people, they legitimately are suffering. They, they are legitimately experiencing distress and they're trying to understand themselves. But I, I feel there's a large contingent also of people who are just using this label as a way to get social accolades, to get to signal their politics, to show they're how woke. Yeah, their wokeness, their progressiveness. And uh, I, I think in many cases, too, it depends on the, the person. I mean, if someone is a public figure and they identify as non-binary, I think a lot of that is about just getting more attention to your brand. Uh, if it's someone who, like in many cases... I think it is young gay people who are not necessarily comfortable with being gay. So if they identify as a different gender, that allows them to avoid having to deal with people who are anti-gay. Uh, in many cases, it's also young women who just don't want to be female because they experience sexism, say, in, in everyday life. And they think, well, if I'm not a woman, I don't have to deal with this. Yet at the same time, they're being tied into the trans community. So isn't that kind of counterintuitive? Because in our current society, trans people are getting more hate than perhaps the gay and lesbian community. I think it depends it, how you look at it. Because I definitely think in certain countries that is the case in North America. I would say actually they're, when you look at, say, young people who are identifying as trans very quickly... Um, there was a study that showed that teachers, so in, in school, teachers are more concerned with anti-trans bullying than they are with anti-gay bullying. So mm -hmm. in many cases, you have gay students who experience bullying. They're not getting any support from anyone. If they, if they transition or they decide to come out as a different, the opposite sex or a different gender, the schools will, in some cases, quite literally throw parties or parades for them to celebrate their decision. So I would wow. say this is probably more so the case in very progressive cities. If you go to less progressive places, I'm sure there's an equal amount of, of um, discrimination for anyone who is, if you're gay, regardless of sexuality, gender, identity. Um, but I, I see this, the reason I wanted to focus on this with my book is I grew up in the gay community. And I do think there is a larger sentiment of homophobia driving this push, especially for young kids to transition by parents who don't want a gay child. Because if you have a little mm. boy, say, who's very feminine, some pa well, some parents just don't want to have a feminine little boy. But I think some parents also have a sense that that little boy is likely to grow up to be attracted to men. So if he transitions to female, when she grows up and is attracted to men, she's going to appear to be heterosexual woman. And... Very few people are talking about that. My colleagues who are clinicians will say that they do see this in their practice. And that upsets me a lot because we're not talking about what is really going on. Um, instead, these parents are being propped up as though they are doing an excellent job of parenting and that they're really loving. And that's not the case. Right. And are there any biological like research or studies done to show that there is a correlation between maybe the parents' genetics or anything like that, that would make it a higher chance that the person would become, uh, would have like gender dys dys dysphoria or uh, turn become a transgender later on. And this is like complete 
bro science, but what I've heard is that someone, let's say a, a, a woman who was highly, highly sexual in her adulthood uh, and in her entire life, if she was highly sexual and had a son, that genetic would potentially transfer over to the son, which would make him turn uh, homosexual. No, I know that's bro science. <laughs> no, I've I don't think I've heard that before. That's I would say there's no evidence for that. <laughs> um, no, it does. Yeah, I figured. So there, there's definitely a biological component to sexual orientation. I do have a chapter dedicated to this in the book, and and, and how exposure to prenatal testosterone can influence sexual orientation. So, it, higher levels of exposure to testosterone in the womb is associated with more male typical interests and behavior and also sexual attraction to women. So, mm. for say a a gay man, on average gay men were likely exposed to lower levels of testosterone. And so the thing is with gender identity that's linked to sexual orientation. They are different things but they're also linked in that um say with trans women, so people who are born male and identify as female, um, there are two subtypes. So one subtype, they will be attracted to men. So born male, identifies female, attracted to men. For them, it, it has to do with prenatal testosterone exposure and potentially feminization of the brain. The mm -hmm. other subtype is attracted to women. So born male identifies as female, attracted to women, as I said. And their experience of gender dysphoria is due to a paraphilia, which is an unusual sexual preference. So this was actually my area of expertise when I was in academia. And I always want to emphasize that I think, regardless of which subtype someone falls into, I think that's perfectly acceptable. It does not justify discrimination against anyone. I do think regardless of what the underlying motivation is in terms of whether it's a paraphilia or not, if someone is an adult and they decide to transition, that's their business. Um, so those are my that's my main those are my main concerns because what you'll see when people if you were to look up the term autogynophilia, which refers to sexual arousal at the idea of be, becoming a woman. Pretty much anything you find, I mean, you have to dig quite a bit on the internet, but a lot of what you'll find is people saying that this doesn't exist. This is pseudoscience. Again, it's hateful, um, but it is legitimate research. Uh, it's the work of my colleague, Ray Blanchard. Um, and anyone who works with adults with gender dysphoria, they know that this exists, but they will never go on the record saying so because they're too afraid to because of the backlash they'll face as a result of it. Mm -hmm. Um, even to talk about gender dysphoria in children, and I, I always talk about um, how the vast majority of these kids will desist by puberty, so they're more likely to grow up to be gay in adulthood. They're not going to be transgender. To me, that should not be controversial. To me, that should not be a partisan issue, because ultimately it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you're on the left or the right or where you are on the political compass. If children are undergoing interventions that are not ultimately going to help them, that should be everyone's concern. But I understand because people are afraid that that information is going to be misused and to say that no one across the board should be allowed to transition. But even saying something like that, people will go, I mean, if you go to the medical, look at what the medical organization, scientific organizations are, are saying in their guidelines, they are really advocating for early early transitioning. Um, so basically encouraging- Hourly? From, I mean, some gender clinics are seeing kids as young as three. So pretty much, I, I see things on social media, kids as young as 18 months. Some parents will say, my child says that they are the opposite sex, so we have allowed them to transition at 18 months. And if it's going to be completely unnecessary, it just, it doesn't make sense. And the other thing is a social transition is associated with going on and, and also continuing into medical, tra uh, medical interventions, which is something that I don't think the public is aware of. I don't think parents who um, allow their kids to transition even necessarily know this. They're being told that it's completely harmless. A, so, a social transition is uh, inconsequential, that a child can change their mind at any time. But that's not what the research shows. And what exactly are they doing during these transitions for, let's say, some kid that is five or seven years old? 
Well, at that point, hopefully they are only doing a social transition because the medical guidelines do say puberty blockers should not be started until puberty. So uh, at that point, they will, if they live as the opposite sex, they'll usually take on a new name. They will either grow their hair long or cut it, depending on whether they now identify as a girl or a boy. You have some parents who are now raising non-binary children. So it's funny because as I've been watching how this conversation has been unfolding over the last few years, every step of the way, I think that it can't get more absurd or that these activists or these woke people, woke folks, can't push things to another level of insanity. But they always do. So now you have these parents who are raising non-binary children and kids have no conception of gender until about ages five to seven. So young kids will say all kinds of things. Doesn't mean that they are a third gender. It doesn't mean that they're neither male or female. And it's actually up to their parents or guardians to give them feedback so that they do have an accurate understanding that for the vast majority of people, their gender does not change. And I, I mentioned with kids, it's flexible, but because kids are de still developing, that's why it, it's more flexible and malleable in them. So yeah. if you if you don't correct a child in their understanding, they're going to be very confused. And so this is what I think is going to happen. These kids are going to grow up and they're not going to have an accurate understanding of, of the world around them. And I think in many cases, it's parents who are really just project, projecting onto their kids um, or they're just they're using their children as a way to show off how open minded they are. Right, right. It's like an Asian parent wanting you to be a doctor so that they can back to their friends, right? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you got the lucky end on that one, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a journalist now, so it doesn't really count. <laughs> right, right. Well, Dr. Deborah. <laughs> but, um, well, okay. So I, I totally agree. I mean, I think to be, to have parents make that such a vast, important decision for their child at such an early age where their children, you know, they don't even know division or multiplication at that point to make that life altering decision for them. I mean, you're, you're not talking about like for a man, like circumcision or nurse circumcision. This is like their entire life that they are pivoting them towards. And yeah, it's, it's, it seems like a, a very, big decision. And I don't know if there's anything legally that's being done to prevent that, but you're saying any parent today can make that decision for their child without any blockage or anything like that. Uh, no, I mean, the system is very much in favor of transition and full stop. And mm -hmm. in Canada, where I'm based in Toronto, as we were talking about earlier, there is a bill that's about to be passed into law that actually criminalizes any therapies that do not affirm a child. So if, if there's a child with gender dysphoria and the parents take them to a therapist, the therapist has to affirm the child. And if not, they wow. potentially face five years in prison. So that's really scary because already <sighs> my colleagues who do clinical work, they are telling me they can't do their job. So many of them either will refuse to work with patients with gender dysphoria because they don't feel ethical about it. Many leave the fields. Um, and so what you have instead are activists who have come in and are taking over. And so they are more than happy to facilitate whatever the patient wants because they think that they're on the so-called right side of history. And again, it's yeah. also them, I think, showing off and saying, look, look how virtuous I am. I'm helping these kids. But it's completely anti-scientific the way that they're going about it. Well, it, it seems like this is something you could approach with data and results where you could say, listen, certain number of people that did this too early ended up either reverting back or did not, uh, you know, did not maintain their status as non-binary or trans, or even worse, they faced a lot of depression or anything that can show that early transition too early is uh, has a very negative effect to it. Isn't there enough data out there that you can go to the government and be able to provide these findings? There was one Swedish study that showed that approximately 2% of people who would transition detransition. So they transition to the opposite sex and then changed their mind and went back to living as their birth sex. But that study, I believe the data were, it, this was published several years ago. This was before the, the larger influx we're seeing of 
especially young women who are very quickly identifying as transgender and who are going in and taking testosterone, getting double mastectomies, and then saying, actually, that was a mistake. I mean, in some cases, they will have a hysterectomy. Sometimes they'll have their ovaries removed. I mean, they, it can be really serious. And then they wake up when they're in their 20s and they say, that was a mistake. So we don't have those numbers yet because this is still very new. And the, the other yeah. problem is that to even want to research this because it's so controversial and because people will quickly call you transphobic for doing so, no legitimate scientists want to touch this subject. So there has only been one study to date um, on this, this phenomenon called rapid onset gender dysphoria. Um, and I think any- You say 2%, 2% of people regret Right. Regret this. I mean, 98% actually are okay with the early transition. Yes, but this is not including rapid onset gender dysphoria. This was before this right. phenomenon. This, I would say ROGD has only really become prominent or really a, a significant problem that we're talking about and noticing in the last two or three years, not even. It's, it's still very new. Yeah. Because it's, I would say even only in the last year, you're starting to really, hear, because because for the most part, media, left-leaning media outlets won't talk about this. They will say that it's a myth. They'll say that detransitioners are a myth and they don't really exist, or they're so statistically rare that it doesn't matter. But I do think there are going to be many, many more cases. Um, in the UK, we're seeing in one county, there are hundreds of young women coming out and saying, I tr transitioned to male and that was a mistake. And now, mm -hmm. now what do I do? Um, and the other thing, too, is because, especially for non-binary, there's such a, double mastectomies are so common for young people who identify as non-binary. Or I even would say for for a young woman who is not happy with her body, because I hear from a lot of parents about this, they are just being given the green light to have their breasts removed. And some of these girls are very young. I mean, the youngest case I've heard of is 12 years old. Um, and I don't think, I mean, puberty it's a natural part of puberty to be uncomfortable with your body. And I, I'm not sure why adults are not saying that as part of the conversation. I think if, if mental health professionals could do a proper assessment and talk about what else is going on in someone's life, is this really going to be the best thing for them? And they determine that it is, then I would have less of a problem with it, even for someone who's very young. And previously, I mean, if, clinicians could do their job. I would say even at puberty, if a child is still uncomfortable in their body and they decide that they want to transition, then that's their business. But professionals cannot do their jobs now. And we're going to see the effects of this in a few years, because I think the UK is waking up sooner. Um, they're actually listening to these young people and their stories. North America, we're definitely not there yet. Right now, it's still very much these kids are being glorified and transition in childhood is still being glorified very much. Yeah, and I feel like puberty is such a huge part of the of, of just changing our hormones and 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 having an impact in terms of who we are as human beings. That any time before making such a big decision like that is is so early, but at the same time, what you're saying is all of this stuff is happening so soon, which hence why you got the book coming out and why you're really rushing to to talk about this. So, but there's, I guess the dilemma is that there's not enough data to show that there is a negative consequence to it because the only data that you have so far is showing that, I guess, most people don't regret it because there wasn't the rap rapid onset uh, in the past. And I guess this is such a tricky thing with human psychology because we have this sunk cost uh, of not wanting to go back on our word, I guess, in, in some sense. So when someone does make some sort of a decision and they really invest money, oftentimes surgery, time, their entire identity in terms of making a decision to say that they regret that decision five or 10 years later, it's probably a very difficult thing for someone to admit from like an ego perspective as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that the detransitioners I spoke with and I interviewed for the book would say to me that people really underestimate how shameful it is and how embarrassing it is to say you've been making everyone in your life refer to you as the opposite sex 
and using different pronouns and a new name. And now you're telling them, actually, we're going to go back to the way it was before. And it's it's really turning their life upside down. It's not something that's easily done. And especially for young kids, when they're getting so much attention and praise from the adults in their life, not just their parents, but their teachers, the doctors, and, and even their peers, how do you then say, actually, I'm going to turn away from all of that and, and I made a mistake? Because I think if yeah. anything, other kids in the class look at that and say, well, my peer is getting all of this attention and praise. What do I need to do to get that same amount of attention and praise? So that one study that I mentioned on rapid onset gender dysphoria by Lisa Lippman, it came out in 2018. That one did speak to actual scientific data about these mostly young women um, and their, their reasons for transitioning, what was going on with them. A lot of them have underlying comorbidity. A lot of them are on the autism spectrum. Uh, many of them have other you know, mood disorders, eating disorders, history of sexual trauma. So that does speak to the fact that this is something, because I'm definitely with you. I think data is the most important thing. It's one thing if there are lots of anecdotes, but until you actually have uh, something that bears out in terms of numbers, I'm skeptical. But the problem, I mean, what Littman faced as a result of publishing that paper, I talk about in my book. She experienced all kinds of backlash and, and also obstacles in terms of having to, how should I say this? With the publication process, usually once a pub, uh, paper is published, that's it. It's already gone through mm. peer review. It's already been vetted. There's no reason why the legitimacy of it should be questioned. But she had to jump through all these additional hoops. There are other papers being pulled that looked at gender dysphoria but didn't conform to activist narratives. So I think it's going to be really difficult. Well, it is really difficult for legitimate scientists to study this objectively. Um, I think it's going to be a while before we see actual unbiased research coming out on this because everything you're going to be seeing for the next while is going to be very much saying that transition is is the only way for these kids yeah right and i, I agree to your point about how severely the government is taking I, I think this is just canada you said where doctors have to affirm to the parents request if they want their kids to transition i mean that's very extreme and the punishment that they can that they can receive for for denying that uh, it seems like there is a middle ground that we need to find at least where perhaps, uh, you know, transition is completely fine if you're an adult and you truly feel that way. Um, but there should be, there shouldn't be like consequences if the doctor says this is not a legitimate reason for being able to transition, uh, or like a certain age maybe to limit the, the, how early you get. I mean, are there benefits of doing it early? Uh, versus doing it at, at the maybe after puberty in the teenagers? Is that why the government is promoting much earlier transitions? Well, actually, in the U.S., there are conversion therapy bans in 20 states, and that includes gender identity. So the, the thing is with conversion therapy bans, I am fully in support of banning conversion therapy for sexual orientation because those are attempts at changing someone's sexual orientation from gay or bisexual to straight, which is not possible because sexual orientation is immutable. But gender identity is not the same, as I mentioned, especially in young kids, because it can change over time, especially before puberty. So it's been very smart marketing on the part of the activists to lump in gender identity into the, the definition of conversion therapy because people are very reluctant to say they are against conversion therapy, even though sexual orientation and gender identity are not the same. I think most people actually don't realize that they're different things in that way. People think that gender identity is something that, because what, what you'll hear in terms of the popular narrative is that someone who is uh, transgender has felt that way from a very young age, it can't be changed, they tried to fight it, they couldn't, this is who they are, and, and people should not question that. And to question that is harmful. And again, I'm very much in favor of offering support and care to trans people, but from a scientific perspective, that's not true, as we see. So that's, um, that's part of the reluctance. Um, the part of your question was, oh, the benefits of, so if, if a child blocks puberty, that will make it easier for them to live as the opposite sex because they won't have to undergo physical changes that will make them appear to be more like the, the sex they were born as. And I actually previously thought that this, uh, 
made sense. I mean, many of the myths in my book are myths that I once believed myself. And it was only after I started stu studying sexology, which is the scientific study of sex and gender, that I realized they didn't actually bear out in reality. Um, so I think that's part of also why people don't want to challenge this because they think, well, it, it superficially does make sense. Why would you want a child to undergo the changes of puberty and that if that's going to potentially create more suffering for them? But what I think most people don't realize is the process of puberty can actually help a lot of these kids outgrow the gender dysphoria that they feel. Right, and that's where the data shows, right? You're saying mm -hmm. most people that end up not transitioning end up becoming more gay or lesbian. Um, well, I guess the, the devil's advocate for that, I guess, would be, I'm wondering if that's the case because being gay or lesbian is just more accepted in society, particularly in areas like Toronto and more progressive states around the U.S. versus being non-binary or trans, uh, which is more recently becoming more accepted, but still has much far ways to go. Are there any thoughts around that? Well, mm -hmm. I have thought about that. And with, I mean, with the kids, if you do talk to the parents you know, as I said, some of them will say that they will, they're perfectly happy with their child transitioning. Some of the detransitioners I talked to was, told me that when they decided to, de to detransition, their parents weren't happy about it because they didn't want them to be lesbian, which mm. to me is really, really sad. Um, mm. and, and I think also just the fact that I, I, I guess I am, I don't want it to ever seem like I'm pitting the two communities against each other, which critics will sometimes say I'm doing, and that's not my intention. I just think it's important to be able to talk about this honestly and, and say it for what it is, because in many cases, you'll see people who have come out as gay, they'll come out as gay first, or they'll come out as lesbian first, and then they will identify as non-binary, um, or they'll decide they want to be trans. And I mean, I guess it is possible that they didn't realize fully who they were until later on but it's just the speed at which this is happening that makes me skeptical and it's also just there from a professional standpoint I can tell you that you definitely get a lot more um, people are much happier with you when you say the right thing about these movements um, for sure so uh, I think there's an additional incentive incentive there but I, I do understand what you're saying I mean I I I still think that um, I think it's important to advocate for fighting discrimination against anyone who is is different in that way, right? And I think regardless of whether someone's gay or trans, it just it bothers me when people are not talking honestly about what's going on. Right, right, and we just want to have a conversation around that at the end of the day, instead of delusion land where we're we're trying to deny science for what it is. And I guess we're both coming at it from a perspective of trying to find the right solution. Because at the end of the day, all of us are aligned that we want rights for trans people. And the people um, involved in it is just the way we're approaching it, I guess, is where some people defer in some sense, because it does impact laws, it does impact parenting, and a lot of these negative implications if we're not talking about the science. Also, I would say my skepticism is in the fact that most of the people who are coming out as trans are young women. It's not equal across people born male and female. So it wow. historically was in people born male. Gender dysphoria was, when you, referrals to gender clinics were predominantly in Ma people born male, but now it's in the last 10 years, it's flipped to female. And if it is due to social acceptance, why is it we're not still seeing the same or then equal, roughly equal number of people born male? Um, huh. Non-binary, we still, as I said, don't have the research for that. But my sense is when you, something that is related is the word queer. So I don't like to use the word queer because to me, that's a slur. That's an anti-gay slur. But I see people who have not, who are essentially straight. I mean, there was one study about this looking at people who self-identify as queer and they're actually straight women. And to me, if you're straight, you should not be using that word. So the question is, why is it? Why are they choosing to self-identify that way? And I think it's because, again, it's a way of, of signaling your 
progressivism. And I think it's also a way to make yourself seem like a victim because unfortunately victim culture I think is a real thing. And I think people place some more emphasis on the weight of your opinions if you are seen as oppressed. So yeah. white people are seen as having privilege. So if you can identify as some sort of sexual or gender minority, that's going to give you some points in that area. Right, right. But as, as you yeah. know, Asians, we're white now too. <laughs> that's what I've heard. Yeah, apparently we're white. <laughs> Although we still can't get into Harvard, so I don't know what's up with that. <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, <laughs> well, wh why do you think it's younger women now looking to transition? You said it's younger women now looking to transition more into becoming men, right? Or are you saying younger women becoming more non-binary? Both. I would say probably Both. it's okay. been more more men, although non-binary is growing um, because that's just tr probably newer and trendier. I think it's because, I mean, I've been critical of feminism in the past. I write in the book about how I used to really identify as a hardcore feminist, and I'm still very much in favor of gender equality. Um, but so that said, I do also think in some ways sexism can play a role in people's decisions, and especially for young women when they're being told that life as a woman is so terrible and that misogyny is everywhere and that it's going to be something you're going to be battling your whole life. I definitely would say, yeah, I mean, as a woman, I've experienced sexism, but in North America, life is pretty good. I wouldn't say that it's something that is holding us back to the point where we can't make meaningful decisions or pursue what we want in life. But I think for young women, especially, they have negative experiences and they're now being encouraged to transition to something other than female. Why wouldn't they? And mm. Also, for many of them, they don't, I think they don't feel, or they'll say they don't really feel like a typical girl. They feel either more masculine, they're not interested in the things that, when they look around, that other young women are interested in. So they think that must mean I'm not a woman. I must other be a man or some other category. And mm. that, that upsets me because I think the definition of woman should be able to encompass a lot of different types of women. And just because you are maybe more male typical, that doesn't mean you're not a woman. You can still yeah. be, you don't have to be super girly and feminine to be a woman, ultimately. Right. And are you seeing, are you seeing these data coming out more from places like the US or is this more global stats? I would younger say- younger women are becoming more, yeah. Yeah, probably, probably North America and the UK. Um, okay. Yeah. And I think that's that's what's regressive because why are we saying to young women if you're even slightly different then you're not female? Right. Yeah, I, I just wonder how this applies and, and how this would differ from, you know, if we were to look at it from like a global perspective. So for example, let's say um, South Korea, um, for example, or yeah, I would say South Korea where the definition of the way men express their gender it's probably a bit different than how a lot of people in the U.S. Uh, let's say, let's say uh, you know, someone in Texas or someone that is, um, yeah, generally in the U.S. It would express what masculinity feels. I mean, a lot of South Korean men wear makeup, and a lot of them, you know, it, they grow out their hair longer. It's just a very different way to express their gender. And because of that, I've, I've seen that a lot of women, you know, are into more, I guess, like the sensitive, prettier men versus the attractive thing here for women is to be attracted to like the masculine person. So like the divergence of that might be uh, perhaps at least my hypothesis is why I, I could imagine if a woman here in the U.S. or Canada if they don't, you know, if, they, if they're not as girly, if they're not as that, maybe they feel that they're more like a male, whereas, whereas like a woman in Korea, they also see a man who's just as girly as them or, or like maybe as much girlier than the, than the typical man in the US may feel have, a, they, they may have a very different opinion around that. I just wonder how these things might play out because I think those are huge distinctions in terms of what masculinity is defined as versus the U.S. and let's say Korea. 
Yeah, and I would, I think by, say, North American or this non-binary movement's perspective, if there's a man who wears makeup, then he's non-binary too. So, <laughs> I mean, it's a very weird way of viewing gender roles. And I, and the reason I see it as regressive is because, yes, I think the same thing with men. If, if a man wants to wear makeup or wear high heels and a dress, that doesn't make him non-binary. He's just a man who likes to wear maybe more feminine clothing. But he's still a man. Yeah. And to me, to then kick him out of the the man category and say that he's a third gender because of that, to me, is just as regressive as saying that, essentially, you know, the more old, I guess, the more stereotypical view that women have to be very feminine and men have to be very feminine. And that's the way it is. And if you're if you deviate from that in any way, then that's not acceptable. But I mm. think. I mean, when you say women are attracted to that, I did, you know, I, I maybe this is probably a different conversation, but I have noticed, and I'd be curious to get your thoughts on this, that with the popularity of K-pop, my sense is that, that there is more of, um, I think people who may not have been as open to dating interracially when it comes to Asians have been more willing to, um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure why that is, or if that's something that you would agree with, but that's something I've definitely noticed more of. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, I mean, I again, I live a lot of my times in Mexico. I'm currently here in Spain. So you, you do get a lot of people calling me out. And it's for me, it's no longer just Chino Chino, which is is just as annoying. But it's, you know, it, people are calling me out more for K-pop or for... Um, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a much different way to look at I guess Koreans in general and and Asian men in general. So I do agree that is a part of it. I think also like maybe in the U.S. particularly, I've seen a lot of women talk about how masculinity is also becoming different, and it's no longer about how strong a man is necessarily. Oftentimes, it's how vulnerable the man is and how in touch with his emotions um, he is. So I, I do agree. Like what we're being attracted to is certainly changing. And I don't know if that's the same for a man to a woman. I don't know if that's necessarily changing as much. I do know that men are certainly, uh, you know, at least for me, attracted to uh, a woman that is career successful and someone that is, you know, very well independent and stuff like that. And maybe that wasn't the case 60 years ago where the equality between men and women weren't the same. Um, so I guess these things certainly do change. Um, but I, yeah, I, I do find it interesting that there is more of a prominence of males turning into females. For example, I don't know if this is an appropriate term, like lady boys. I think that term is not as PC, but I know what you mean. They're called the Katui. Is that the Katui? Katui. Oh, sorry. Yes. I said Kathoe. Oh, um, no. Yeah. So, and that's like a huge thing in in Thailand. I, have you ever actually wondered why that is? Like, why is it in Thailand particularly that there's such a prominence of Katuis there versus other places? Um, my sense is it's there's a cultural aspect to it in that there are cultures in which m the male role or what's considered acceptable for men in terms of how they behave is more rigid. So if someone is um, deviates from that, then they're n not considered male. Um, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Because you'll see that, I mean, because people will, critics will say culture plays a larger role than biology, which it doesn't. But at the same time, I don't think it plays zero role. I think it can influence the interpretation um, of gender, but it doesn't influence ultimately how someone will actually identify. So those individuals, if they were in a Western context, they would be considered gay men. Right, right. Not, yeah, right. It's ironic because uh, Buddhists, Buddhists believe that people that are Katois is not by choice, but because of karma. And it's because they've sinned in their past lives. So they frame it as something that they don't have control over. It's just because of the person that they lived in their past lives. 
uh, yet there's such a prominence there, despite it being such a religious nation. Um, so I just find these things like fascinating of how these things come about and how different it is here in in the U.S. Um, and people, apparently, yeah. oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say some people will say third culture, um, third gender cultures are a sign that gender is not binary. But I talk in the book as to why that's not true. Because as I said, they are, for the most part, if they were in a North American setting, they'd be considered gay men. Gotcha. Gotcha. Do you ever think that this could change in the future where assuming that we are our brains and everything else in our bodies could technically be replaced by robotic parts or, or you know, 3D printing hearts and stuff like that. Is there a case that where it's just our brains that are left and we can just transplant our brain into a robotic body that genders don't really play a role? I think that technology would be great for people who do want to transition and that it, it could potentially facilitate transitioning for them. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think at the end of the day, so it's funny because you were saying how with, say, what's considered acceptable for, or what's considered attractive in men. And there's been, um, I think uh, uh, it's good that men are encouraged to express their emotions, express vulnerability. I think, I don't think men should be held to a different standard than women in that way. But I also think straight women are being told that men are toxic and that men who are masculine or stereotypically masculine are some somehow harmful to them or that they're sexual predators or something like that, which I don't agree with. But these same women will still be very much attracted to very masculine men. So right. I think ultimately, unless we take the role of the prenatal environment out of the equation, how our brain has developed is still very much going to be set by biology. So even if we do have the technology to completely change our physical reality or our bodies, there's still going to be a very strong element of that that is that is preset. Do you think that um, a woman that feels masculine would still feel attracted to a very masculine person? Like, how does the dynamic in a relationship work? It probably depends, I mean, on the individuals. I'm thinking of the research in terms of what it shows. I mean, most men prefer, most straight men prefer feminine women. Um, yeah. But that's not to say there aren't some who prefer masculine women, regardless of whether they, the man himself is more masculine or more f feminine. So it would probably depend on on the actual dynamic between two people. But uh, I would, yeah, I would say, and I mean, this is, I don't think it should be controversial to say that most men prefer feminine women and most women prefer masculine men. Gotcha. If you're, if you're straight, yeah. Well, you have a section in here that women should not act like men in sex and dating. Can you can you elaborate a little bit on that? That was yeah. a topic I immediately just jumped to in the, in the book title. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and this, if your audience is curious to listen to it. The audiobook is read by me and there's actually an excerpt of it nice. available. If you go to Amazon or Simon & Schuster has it on SoundCloud and you can listen to the first five minutes of that chapter. So this is something, this is a myth that women should behave like men in sex and dating. I think it's doing a real disservice to young women, also young men, because they're being told that there are no differences between the sexes. And so uh, essentially there should be no differences in the way that they approach courtship, dating, mm -hmm. their, their sexual relationships. And if, if a woman goes into it with that expectation, I mean, I have so many young women who would reach out to me saying they're really confused because they're being told particular messages either by the media um, or, or just they're being told if you are a strong and empowered woman that you believe that you are no different from men in any way, including in sex. And so you should pursue sex the way that men do or you should enjoy casual sex as much as men and if you don't there's something wrong with you and so I get these young women who are telling me that they are really confused they're really unhappy so I wrote that chapter for them and what I find really interesting is that um, I, I talk about how evolutionary psychology should not be seen as sexist evolutionary psychology is still very much a part of who we are um, yes birth control exists but it can't override the millions and millions of years 
preceding it. And to pretend that it doesn't exist does us a disservice. So a lot of people will say that evolutionary psychology is degrading to women. It says that women should have stereotypical gender roles or that we should be submissive, things like that. And I'm, I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying if you understand the scientific research, it's going to help you in your personal life. And I mean, this, these are things I've learned that have helped me along the way. So I wrote that chapter to, to say, yes, you know, women don't feel bad if you don't like casual sex as much as your your male friends or your boyfriends because we on average are not the same and that's not to say that there are not some women who would do enjoy casual sex or that there aren't some men who don't but on average these are the trends we see yeah, I also am very clear to say I don't think evolutionary psychology should be used to justify bad behavior in your partners or to justify cheating or leering at, at people who are not your your significant other anything like that but that whole conversation is taken off the table now and, and people just simply say, and I, in a lot of cases it's people who know nothing about evolution or evolutionary psychology, they will just say that's misogynistic, that has, that's really outdated to think like that. And if you deny it, you're just going to, I think, learn the hard way as to why these things are actually true. And from a, like an evolutionary perspective, why is it that men are perhaps having more, more, more inclined to have casual sex versus females? Because for women, the act of sex is a greater investment because there's the chance for pregnancy and with pregnancy comes caring for that child, making sure that child survives. Whereas for men, I mean, obviously today, um, men are very much invested in the parental role. But from a historical perspective for men, um, it's more about just spreading your seed. So um, men are wired in a way to facilitate that, whereas for women, they're wired to be more attached to their partner. Right, and you're saying females look at that, ignore the evolutionary facts, and they look at that as more of a way to find equality for with men by having more casual sex. Or, I mean, some women, I imagine they just want to have more casual sex. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, but in many cases... Uh, if a woman is engaging in casual casual sex with a man, it's because she's hoping for a relationship. And research has actually shown this. Uh, whereas for men, if they are engaging in casual sex, for the most part, they just really want sex and that's it. That's that's the only goal. And when I, so the, the Globe and Mail, I'm a, a monthly columnist for them, they're Canada's national newspaper. They ran an excerpt from that chapter and it went to number one on their website within an hour, which totally blew me away. And I got so much feedback from young women saying, I see this in my friends and they're they're going out and they're they're sleeping around and they're they're almost forcing themselves to do that because they think that's what they're supposed to do but they're so unhappy and now I understand why. So, mm. you know, I th something like that where you for young women you don't have to be anything to be empowered. You just be who you are. That's ultimately my my message. I mean, for anybody, I don't think we have to live up to anyone's expectations. And so that explains, you know, the non-binary aspect, explains the casual sex and the just the push for young women to be like men in order to be considered equal. I have a real problem with that because that to me is what's sexist. I don't think it's sexist to say that men and women are on average different in some ways. Right, which we are. And, and to me, that totally makes sense. And it, it seems like you're, you're kind of bringing this down to the fact that it really just comes down to self-worth in a lot of ways where women just need to be, um, I mean, they don't need to be, but you, it's a lot of it just comes down to loving who you are and, and accepting for who you are. Yeah, and I, I think, I mean, I feel I can't really blame them, especially if they're being fed this. I mean, this is what they're teaching in university. And I think also for young men, they feel like they're being told that masculinity is pathological. And they are also very confused because they don't know, should they approach a woman if they're interested? Is that considered sexist? Should they let her be the one to initiate? So I offer some guidance in that way too, because it really is, I think, is putting a strain. Uh, academic feminism is definitely putting a strain on the relationship between men and women. Yeah, unnecessarily. It, it is confusing. I, I don't know. Uh, well, I don't want to ask too much of your, your dating life, but as someone that is in that position that understands the science behind that, um, I guess how do you look at, you know, that idea of equal roles in relationships? Because I think it's a confusing, uh, 
time for a lot of men. And oftentimes I see a division of men and women becoming greater and greater because of the confusion in a lot of ways from both sides. And for me as a man, just being able to figure out, you know, what are the lines where I need to still be a gentleman, let's say if paying for the first date, and at the same time, making sure that she feels that she's an equal part in the relationship. So, you know, I guess that's like the confusing part for, for men. Like, should you pay for the first date? Should you open the door? Or is that going to turn off the woman? Because one person might want that because maybe she grew up with a dad that was much more affectionate and took care of her. Um, and maybe the other person won't. So you get like very different reactions in these days. I guess, how do you navigate that in these relationships for both women, men and women today? So I say very clearly in the book that I do think men should initiate and men should pay on the first date. And this is not, where to even begin with this? Because I think in saying that, people will say, well, that's sexist. But again, if you're coming at it from the perspective that women or men are operating at different baselines, there needs to be some assurance that the man is invested or that he will invest in his partner because otherwise he's not going to take you seriously as a woman. And I think women are being told that to have standards like this, that means they're a gold digger. And I think it is unfair that women and men are being held to different standards in that way or that women and men's priorities are denigrated in different ways because I say in the book how women who do place a, an emphasis on um, status and on financial security and their partners, they are derided as gold, gold diggers. But for men who are interested in younger, very pretty um, partners, then they get an eye roll at most. So obviously I don't think that's the mm. only thing that should be your priority when you're dating but I think people do feel like, like for men that I've talked to, they, they are afraid, as you said, to pull the, hold the door, pull the chair out, to even to pay because they're afraid of offending somebody. And I think even if someone, even if a woman doesn't feel like that's necessarily, uh, that she doesn't necessarily need that from her partner, she shouldn't get offended about it. Because I've heard stories where my male friends will go on dates and they'll say that the women were actually mad that he held the door open. Um, and I, I think that usually is a sign of, of something else. But I talk about when in, in the book, yeah. you know, I talked to some of my male friends about uh, my dating life and they uh, they will say that they think I'm sexist. And I, I think, no, I'm just, I'm just informed. <laughs> Good answer. Well, when you go on dates as, as, as the, uh, you know, as the person that you're going on a date with understands your role and how much, you know, this is your profession, uh, is it make it a little bit more difficult for you? Or does it actually become easier because they understand that you understand, you know, the, the, the dynamics of everything of how it works? I think it depends because there are, there are a number of different ways it can play out. Um, for, for me as a writer, I'm very clear about my personal and professional boundaries. So I very rarely write about my personal life. I did in some sections of the book just because I, I thought that would be helpful to readers. Mm -hmm. But in, as a, especially as a former sex researcher, I feel like my personal life is very much not something that has any bearing on what I, what I have to say about the scientific research. And people are, are often surprised by that because I think there's a, a particular idea that they have when you study sex or when you write about sex research. Um, so I, I think in terms of how people tend to be very open, they usually want to talk to me about their personal life, which is great. I mean, I don't, I, I don't really think that... The way I approach it, I use the scientific research, obviously, but at the same time, I'm still a human being. So <laughs> I make mistakes <laughs> like everyone. And, For sure. Um, what was the other part of your question? It was, oh, do people feel, I think people, It. you know what the good thing about being a sex researcher, It's. it helps you filter out people. I think people who are mm. going to be weirded out by what I do are just by default not going to want to engage with me. Um, so I know like, it's very important to me, both professionally and in my personal life, that people are open-minded. And so that is one way for me. I just, I think people naturally will steer away from me if they, if they have preconceived ideas of what someone who studies sex is like. So that's probably in some way. But I did write in the book about 
you know, there was one date I went on and there was a man talking about pornography. I won't, I won't go too much in terms of what actually happened, but that was one way in, in which I was able to use my scientific expertise and I could tell he was not being sincere. So in that way, it has been helpful. Right. And the fact that people know that you started paraphilia, is, do, do they make it, is it more open of them revealing some of their kinkier and some of their weirder fetishes? I mean, I don't know exactly how weird we're talking. Is it like a fetish for feet or are we talking something completely different? Well, when I, when paraf- I talk about paraphilia, it, it has to do with the very specific definition in terms of distress and impairment if it's a paraphilic disorder. And it has to be someone's primary sexual interest. So I think a lot of people have various kinks or preferences that um, may not be their primary interest. So huh. that said, there's a whole range. I mean, some people might think they're super kinky, but what's super kinky to one person might be really plain vanilla to another person. And I always True. tell people that I'm vanilla, and I think most people have a hard time believing that. But I do find people are much more open with me wanting to talk about that. Or what I love is when people will approach me in public if I'm at, say, a birthday party or something or at a dinner, and they will ask me questions that they have about either their sex life or about their partners or their friends' partners. And I just think, um, I, I find it fascinating and I love that people feel that they can open up to me about that stuff that's obviously very personal, but also that I have this encyclopedia in my mind in some ways in terms of understanding sexual behavior in a way that I think unless you know the scientific research, it can it can be murky water. Right. Yeah. No, that totally makes sense. Um, well, I want to be respectful of your time, Dr. Deborah, and um, want to get an idea. I guess if we were to give the listeners a main takeaway of how they can navigate themselves in these uh, in these situations of the things that we just talked about, what's like a takeaway or lesson that could help them uh, navigate these situations? I think it's really important if you are skeptical to not feel bad in any way about being skeptical because people are being shamed for not going along with these ideas when they have no basis in reality. And I think also information is the best way to fight it. So as I mentioned in my book, I list all the citations and all the studies I talk about. Um, I think also just to not live in fear because cancellation is, as I mentioned to you, it's a real thing nowadays. And that's why people, for the most part, do stay quiet when they are skeptical, even when it is affecting their own family members or or their own lives. And I really think it's only a matter of time until the mob comes for you. So uh, not you specifically, but just people in general. Just me. (laughs) (laughs) This whole thing was about me. (laughs) So... Just know that, I mean, as someone who has been mobbed multiple times on social media, that you will get through it. And the fear of being mobbed is always worse than actually going through it. And if you have to make make ways of preparing in your own life um, in anticipation of should that happen, because it happens to a lot of people now. And I think if you are not prepared or you're not, you don't see it coming, that's much worse than if you are prepared. If you are prepared for it, you can do it. You will survive. Great advice. Love it. And where can people find you online? Obviously, we'll link the book, The End of Gender. Highly recommend you guys check that out. Where else can people find you online? I am on Twitter at Dr. Deborah So. I'm on Instagram at Dr. Deborah W. So. And if you'd like to learn more about me and The End of Gender, I list the nine myths on my website, which is drdebrahso.com. Beautiful. We did it. Hey, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys for uh, tuning in. If we're not canceled by next week, we'll have episodes come out every Wednesday. Uh, Dr. Devar, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Take care.